E with Joe. Hello and welcome to this ninth episode of F E with Joe. Fire Education with me, Joanna. This episode is all about the research. Due to demand, I've been asked to record the presentation made of my research findings into risk and need when working with children who set fires. Your wish is my command. And so please find to follow the presentation for my research study. If you have any questions about the research or would like to request a copy of the full thesis, then please do contact me on the email address at the end of this episode. As always, thank you ever so much for being here. Hello. The presentation I am talking you through today was first delivered to the National Fire Chiefs Council of the UK on the 18th of March, 2021. Two subsequent workshops have seen the same presentation delivered to approximately 140 practitioners, clinicians and academics from the UK, the US, Australia and New Zealand who represent disciplines as diverse as the fire service, social care, youth justice, probation, mental health, counselling and therapy services and psychology. The feedback from the workshops was that the presentation would be really useful as a recording for memory, for group discussions and of course for CPD for staff and so I hope you do indeed find the presentation useful for those purposes. As you can see on screen the presentation is the findings from my thesis at the University of Cambridge. From 2018 to 2020, I was a master's student at the Institute of Criminology at the University of Cambridge. And for my thesis, I chose to look at an exploratory study of how practitioners in UK fire and rescue services working with children and young people who set fires, identify clients requiring psychosocial interventions. It's clear that my study had a focus on the fire service, but there is relevance here for all agencies and professionals who have responsibility for or an interest in children and young people who set fires. Before I get into the detail of the study, it may be useful for you to have a context about who I am and what my interest in this field is. So whether you're new to my FE with Joe YouTube channel and my work, or whether indeed we have worked together before for many years, then everyone is as welcome to share and use this presentation as best fits your needs and purposes. For those of you that don't know me and are indeed new to this channel and my work, I've worked with children and young people for approximately 18 years. It's not an obvious choice of occupation. I didn't go through school saying I'm going to work with kids who burn stuff. So how indeed have I reached this stage in my life and work journey? So I graduated from the University of Oxford and I knew I wanted to work with people but wasn't quite sure in what way or what discipline. So I spent 16 years in the not-for-profit charitable and voluntary sectors, which included working with adults with mental ill health. And then I worked for 10 years for the London Fire Brigade, running their programme for children and teenagers who set fires. During my 10 years with the London Fire Brigade, I completed my postgraduate certificate in child 
adolescent and family mental health. And after 10 years, I decided it was time to indeed work for myself. So that's the capacity in which I present today and my work now. I still work directly with children and families where there are fire setting concerns, whether I am commissioned privately by a family or through a local authority or other organization. I also train frontline staff, provide supervision to frontline staff and managers from a range of different organizations that deliver frontline client work. And during my now eight years of working for myself, I've also been determined that I too always need to keep learning. I answer a lot of people's questions in training, in supervision, who's questioning my answers. And so my constant journey of fulfillment and knowledge saw me from 2018 to 2020 undertaking my master's in applied criminology, penology and management at the University of Cambridge, the study I'm exploring with you today. The title is a long one. I hope it's fairly self-explanatory. The emphasis is, of course, that this is exploratory. Really the first time looking at this subject. How do practitioners in fire services make decisions ultimately about risk and need is what we're talking about here. How do they identify those children that require psychosocial interventions? The background context to this study is, you know now my work and interest in this field, my experience. A wider context is that from the fire setting literature, we know there are two distinct interventions when it comes to addressing fire setting behavior by children. It's either about fire safety education, which is very much the focus of my book that was published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers in 2019 called Children and Teenagers Who Set Fires, Why They Do It and How to Help. So I'm grounded very much in the fire safety education approach. There is also the approach of psychosocial interventions. An obvious example would be cognitive behavioral therapy an intervention I imagine many of us on screen right now will recognise or at least be familiar with. So the literature for a number of decades now has told us they are the two main approaches evidence to be effective, fire safety education or psychosocial interventions. Often you'll see the two working together. A child absolutely will benefit from fire safety education, alongside psychosocial interventions. And in the literature, there is emphasis put on the fact that both of these disciplines are expert, requiring expertise from the practitioners delivering them. The fire setting literature also tells us that fire safety education is the most common intervention for children setting fires. In the UK in 2005, we had a significant evaluation in this field. It looked at interventions for both children and adults who set fires in England and Wales. It was then and remains now one of the most extensive evaluations that has been done of all services working with children and adults who set fires. As with any evaluation, there were a number of key findings and recommendations, and they are referred to in my research. And so anybody wanting a wider context to my current study and this work historically in the UK, I would encourage you absolutely to look at this document to see where were we then and where are we now. The 2005 evaluation established that the majority of fire services provide fire safety education to address fire setting behaviour in children. 
I'm conscious that there may be people on screen listening who aren't based in the UK. The ODPM was the office of the Deputy Prime Minister, where at the time fire services sat within government structures. Currently, the fire service sits within the Home Office alongside the police. Why is this study needed? Why was this the subject of my thesis? Well, despite the fire setting literature making clear that two distinct interventions are needed when children set fires, and an England and Wales study stating, yes, absolutely, there's a requirement for two distinct types of intervention when working with children who set fires. There remains still, 16 years later, 15 years at the time of my study, no national guidance, no standards framework, screening tools or risk assessment to help practitioners identify the very question I'm looking at. How do you identify those children requiring a specialism beyond that of fire safety education alone? So how are practitioners making these risk critical decisions in the absence of such frameworks, guidance and risk assessments? And quite frankly, if not now, then when? For as I looked at the literature as part of my study, when looking at the 2005 ODPM evaluation, the recommendations made remain largely outstanding. There is also a real need to be asking questions about this work because of Grenfell Tower and the fire of 2017. For anyone unfamiliar with this fire, it killed 72 people in their homes in West London, in one of the most affluent boroughs in the UK 72 people died in what should have been the safest place to be. That number of deaths and the fire have placed, I would argue, for the first time, fire services in the UK under a scrutiny that has never been experienced before by fire services. It's under scrutiny from the media, from the public, from grieving families and victims, from politicians. And the first phase of the Grenfell Tower Fire Inquiry looked in particular at the actions of the fire service on the night of the fire. Alongside this public scrutiny, there is also a shift in questions asked about the work of fire services because of how they are now inspected. Previously, fire services audited one another in their practices. Now it falls to Her Majesty's Inspectorate to inspect every fire service of the UK. So a different type of scrutiny around the work carried out by fire services, which includes preventative work. There is also a shift in the governance of fire services where many fire services are now looking to have shared fire and police commissioners. Some are already in existence. So there's a question there about the role and remit of services. And again, with moving into the Home Office alongside the police, this question about, well, what does good governance look like within fire services? And with all that as our backdrop, it really is a case of, if we don't start to ask these questions of ourselves now, how do we make decisions on risk? Then indeed, what are we waiting for? Because that was a thought that was really present for me from Grenfell Tower and since. Grenfell Tower is believed the most probable cause was an accidental fire, a faulty kitchen appliance. Could that faulty kitchen appliance be our eight-year-old playing with a lighter at home? No malice, 
no desire to cause harm, no intent, just natural curiosity that we see in children of that age, yet could have had the same devastating, horrific outcome. What questions would be asked then of fire services? Hence why I really do say, if we don't start asking these questions of ourselves now, well, when will they be asked? By whom? and for what reasons? And so the key research question is, how are fire service practitioners, when they work with children and young people who set fires, identifying those clients requiring psychosocial interventions? Good research and studies start with a literature review where we think, OK, what do we know already about this subject? What's established in an evidence base and where are the gaps in our knowledge? And I looked, of course, to criminology for my literature review, being a student at the Institute of Criminology at the University of Cambridge, but also look to disciplines that included psychology and sociology to try and get a really broad insight into, OK, what do we know already that's relevant to this question and where might we need to have new information? So, of course, I look first to the fire setting literature, much of this coming out of the world of psychology. We know, and I've talked about it already, that in the fire setting literature, fire safety education, when it is used to address specifically fire setting behaviour, it is a specialism and requires expertise of those delivering this type of education. The fire setting literature also makes clear that for many children who set fires, they have in their histories complex trauma and often adverse familial life experiences. Thinking more broadly within the psychological literature, I was also interested in risk, need and responsivity, the RNR literature. R&R is recognised and accepted as one of the most influential models of how we think about assessing and treating risk behaviours. And in particular within the R&R literature, there's an emphasis on what were called first generation risk responses through to where we are currently in fourth generation and beyond responses to risk behaviours. So first generation is very much about an individual, their training, their experience and their gut instinct to make decisions on risk. And of course, we recognise now that that comes with vulnerabilities of human error and of course, individual bias. And so through the r, &R literature, there is a shift from first generation gut instinct responses through to fourth generation and beyond that think of course about the training of the practitioner, of course, absolutely fundamental to foundations. It is also about practice wisdom and experience, but that has to also be complemented and supported by evidence-based risk assessment tools and case management that organisations work and liaise with one another around what are the needs of this person and alongside thinking of risk that we broaden our lens and are mindful of our language and think also about a person's strength their protective factors and their resilience so currently that's where considerations of risk and responses sit. And so I was curious to know, well, in the absence of risk assessment tools, where are fire services in their progression of risk? Where are they in the generation model of responses? 
Similarly, thinking about risk behaviours, I also drew on the defensible decision making literature, again, very much rooted in the world of psychology and criminology, with its growth around work with people who offend. So since 1998 onwards, the defensible decision making literature has recognised that, OK, there will be some people who come back into our communities after time in prison and who will commit further offences, including offences of serious harm like arson, like sexual offences, like murder. With the reality that some people will carry out further offences of harm, then how do we look after the staff involved in those decision making processes? How do we allow practitioners working with risk every day to be able in the event of adverse outcomes like a fatal fire set by a child how can we look at those decisions and see them as defensible for what was known at the time not the hindsight scrutiny that's later applied and whilst defensible decision making is as i explained rooted in work with people who offend well arguably many of our older children setting fires may be viewed as young people with offending behavior their offense is potentially the fire setting so there's a natural parallel there why this literature is relevant for those just working in this field of children and teenagers who set fires but also the defensible decision making model over the decades has been adopted by health, by social care. And if we are determined to consider fire setting behaviour by children as a public health issue, then again, there's a natural need to look to the defensible decision making literature as good guidance and evidence for our work with children setting fires. Maybe less obvious is the self-legitimacy literature. This more commonly is applied to the police and more recently people who work in prisons because it's about looking at, well, what are practitioners' right to exercise their authority over others? So you can see why this is really relevant and pertinent to the police, for example. How do members of the public view the police as legitimate and their authority as legitimate? And how do individual police officers and police services see themselves as having a right to exercise authority? Where does that right come from, this self-legitimacy? And it's rooted in their professional identity, their efficacy and their relationships with their managers and peers in particular. And I was curious to see, well, are there maybe parallels with the fire service? For whilst those two organisations are very different, we know there are also similarities. I've talked already about the coming together now of the police and the fire service again under the Home Office remit. There are shared fire and police commissioners and both are command and control structures at the heart of their organisations. They are hierarchical, they are rank oriented, they are dominated by a white male workforce. So for all the differences, were there also parallels where perhaps the self-legitimacy literature could resonate for fire service staff and especially fire service staff that sit outside traditional command and control structures in doing this work. And when thinking about the individual practitioners doing this work within command and control structures, I was also super curious to think about the emotional labour literature comes from the world of sociology and establishes that for organisational goals to be achieved, individuals manage and display acceptable emotions. Absolutely the case when it comes to anybody working frontline, 
and certainly work in front line with often vulnerable clients, frightened clients? Does it get more frightening than a family that's experienced a fire for whatever reason? And yet, we, even though we might also feel frightened, I'm frightened by a child I work with, I'm frightened by a mother I work with, I don't like a father I'm working with, I don't like the colleague I'm working with. All those legitimate emotions that every single one of us will experience in frontline work, we are asked to put those to one side and always present the professional, the calm, the competent, the confident. So there's the acceptance in the literature that that's what the expectation is. That's the emotional labour people carry in their work. And I was interested to know, well, how well understood is this emotional labour when people are doing work within fire services that isn't the obvious within the command and control structure of their organisation? And so, of course, then we come to thinking about the methodology. How am I going to go about doing this exploratory study? I decided on a mixed methods explanatory sequential study. Another easy mouthful that just trips off the tongue like my study title. So what again does this mean in reality for those who aren't as familiar with academic study? And I'm very much at the start of my journey in this arena alongside my frontline work. Mixed method simply means I did both quantitative and qualitative data and explanatory and sequential in that each sequence of the study was informed by the previous part of the study. So as an example, after carrying out the online survey, the quantitative element of my data, I looked at the results in order to purposefully sample who would then be interviewed over the telephone. So if we take as an example, the question in the survey about the usefulness of the fire setter guidance note issued by the Chief Fire Officers Association, and respondents could select a range of answers from very useful to not at all useful. And I looked at people's responses so I could get a representation in the people I then interviewed. I don't want people who all think it's very useful or who all think it's not very useful or somewhere in the middle. I went for a range to make sure that the voices then heard and represented in the data are mixed. It's not one attitude only coming forward. I had to undertake a quantitative element at the start because prior to this study, it simply was not known just how many fire services are working with children who set fires in this formal way. What are they doing? Where are they doing it? How are they doing it? So I needed the hard statistical data at the start to find out, OK, what's the breadth and type of fire setting interventions being carried out, if at all? But then, of course, I'm looking for the richness behind that data. The survey gave me a good, valuable insight straight away into this field of work, but then I wanted those telephone interviews, the focus group with practitioners, face-to-face -face interviews with very senior managers to really understand better what's sitting behind the figures I've so far established. And so the first stage, the quantitative element, was to send out an online questionnaire to all 53 UK fire services. I want to pick up on the number 53. So at the time of my study, there were 53 UK fire and rescue services. There are now 52 because in the intervening year, Hampshire Fire and Rescue Service and the Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service have merged to become one. So there are now 52 UK fire and rescue services. I also flag up that number 53 or 52 because it's quite common for fire service report in the UK to talk about 48 fire services. That basically they miss out 
those fire services that are smaller, like, for example, the Isle of Man, the Silly Isles, Jersey, Guernsey. Yet, if we want to be truly representative of all UK fire services, we should be looking to collect the data and representation of all 53, 52 UK fire services. And of course, if a report has only taken the data from 48 fire services and then presents percentages of, well, X amount of UK fire services say this, well, that data isn't going to be as accurate because it isn't reflecting all UK fire services. So I simply wanted to flag that up that as readers, we are always scrutinizing the data, the figures. We are curious as practitioners, we are curious as people reading research. So the questionnaire went out. Also went out the request to the three senior managers within the National Fire Chiefs Council who have overall responsibility for this work. What I also have to flag up at this point is the dedication and commitment and openness of the fire services and the three senior managers whom I approached, the senior managers within the National Fire Chiefs Council, because every single fire service in the UK, all 53, and each of those three senior managers within the National Fire Chiefs Council all agreed to take part in the study and responded. That is phenomenal engagement and openness and an ability to say, I will answer your questions and then yes, I am prepared for the scrutiny that you will apply to the data I we have provided. It is remarkable and it is important to absolutely pay testament to that level of dedication and support for this study, which I would suggest in itself tells a story of how much people doing this work want to be seen. They want to be heard. They are thirsty for knowledge in this area and to be the best practitioners they can be, which is beyond impressive and I remain grateful for that energy that allowed this study to be as rigorous as it could be. Especially as you see from the next bullet point that not every organisation I approached did agree to be interviewed. When I approached the inspectorate, so the body, the Her Majesty's inspectorate that now has responsibility for inspecting fire services, when I approached them for an interview, the staff officer I liaised with declined stating that the inspectorate is not in a position to offer the level of detail on this subject that you will need. I must admit this made me curious because part of the inspection criteria of fire services is how they work with other agencies around addressing deliberate fire setting and arson. And so if the inspectorate doesn't have the level of detail required for an interview as part of a study, what then is their level of detail when they are inspecting and rating fire services on this criteria. So something I think for us to be curious about in this field. In addition to the questionnaire, the face-to-face -face interviews, I also put out an invite for a focus group to be held with the 10 fire services from the South East England NFCC region. I chose this region of the UK because it has the densest population. And so when in the focus group I was presenting the participants with vignettes, with case studies, I wanted to ensure that because of the volume of people they deal with year after year, they had lots that they could draw upon to think about when looking at the case studies and talking generally about this work. So 10 invites went out to the 10 fire services across southeast England and seven practitioners were able to attend on the day, each representing seven different fire services. So again, an incredible level of buy-in 
into this study. There were also telephone interviews with 15 practitioners that, as you know, I've already explained, were purposely, sorry, purposefully selected from the survey, both for representation of viewpoints, attitudes and opinions, but also crucially where they were geographically. The 2005 evaluation by the ODPM looked only at England and Wales. I wanted to ensure all of the UK was reflected and included and given a voice, regardless of size of fire service. And so in my telephone interviews, I was able to ensure every country of the UK was represented and every NFCC region of England. Also, were interviewed with two members of staff, not from fire services, but because they provide services for fire services to children who, there's a lot of services going on there, they provide services, there's another service, they provide interventions to children and young people identified by fire services as requiring psychosocial interventions, but the fire services have recognised they don't have the training and expertise to do this work, and so they commission another agency to do this work. One was a children's education charity, the other a counselling service attached to a university. I've used already the word rigour and the level of engagement of people in this study allows it to be rigorous. The 100% response rate to the online survey ensures all 53 fire services are represented in the findings. Of those 100%, 98% agree to further participation where required. It was almost a shame, the limitation of time and the word count for my thesis, that more people could be interviewed when there was this level of engagement. I've said already, it allowed for representation of every country of the UK, every NFCC region of England. And so what this gives us is the opportunity to see excuse me, for the first time, findings that can be generalizable across all UK fire services. Because when there is such a national response, we now can look at national findings and start to say, actually, this is relevant across all UK fire services because of how representative this study is. And so what are the findings? So three major themes came through in this question of how are staff making decisions about risk and need in children who set fires? There was the theme of inconsistency in service provision, an absence of staff self-legitimacy and an invisibility of emotional labour. Taking each of these in turn, inconsistency in service provision was the dominant theme throughout. It came through in the survey and in all aspects of the study, and it took many forms. As an example, even the ages that fire service work with. So as an example, one fire service stops all work with children who set fires at the age of 16. In the UK, the different legislation of Wales, England, Scotland and Northern Ireland all define children as a human being up to their 18th birthday. So we have a fire service working to a different age criteria that they cut off their services for children at the age of 16. So, of course, it absolutely begs the question, well, where do children who are still children in the eyes of the law and the rights they have in law, where do our 17-year-olds go if they set fires? They're too old for children's service, not old enough for adult fire setting provision, if it even existed. 
So there was one example of, well, we've got inconsistency around the age for referral here. To the other end, there were fire services that offered provision up to the age of 25. So going beyond the legal age. And again, an inconsistency in service provision, depending on where you live in the UK, your service may stop at age 16, or it may continue until the age of 25. And it's why the title of my study changed. Originally, it was going to be children, because that does include anyone up to their 18th birthday or before their 18th birthday. And yet I had to say children and young people because of the fire services that did extend their service provision. And you'll probably have noticed that I indeed, through this presentation, have talked about children, teenagers, young people, I'm now starting to mirror and reflect the inconsistency of the study's findings. In the UK, we have this phrase, a postcode lottery. For overseas viewers, it's often uh, called a zip code, for example, in the US. So the statement in the UK that we have a postcode lottery basically means that depending on where you are, in the country will determine what services you get, if any, the quality, the quantity. So is there a postcode lottery when it comes to interventions for children who set fires and the provision within fire services? And you can see the figures do indeed highlight there is a postcode lottery because of the 53 fire services, 51 provide fire setting interventions for children who set fires. So straight away, we can see the vast majority do provide interventions and support, but there are two in the UK that do not, which they attributed to their small size and lack of capacity for this work. But of course, it throws up the question, a little like our 17 year olds who may be outside the criteria for support. Well, what of those families in these two areas of the UK where there isn't this provision, especially in the one area where the fire service didn't have referral pathways formally, either to a neighboring fire service or other support service for children? What happens to children and families in those areas where there is fire setting behavior? Of the 51 fire services providing interventions, all deliver fire safety education. But four also provide psychosocial interventions. And so immediately in the survey data, we have an inconsistency in service provision. Arguably, the majority of fire services are doing what would seem to be a natural fit for fire services, the role and remit surely of fire services is fire safety education. Who better than the women and men in fire services to deliver fire safety education? Yet there are four fire services that have identified, no, we can also provide a psychosocial intervention. I've already explained that two fire services do that through commissioning an external organisation, but there are two fire services that have identified, no, in our own staff, we have the role and remit, the training and expertise to provide psychosocial interventions. So a real distinct difference in service provision, an inconsistency in what is available depending on where you are in the country. This difference in the role and remit of the fire service then started to come out in the qualitative data. So when I interviewed the National Fire Chiefs Council and I saw each of the three senior managers separately in their face-to-face -face interviews, there was a real difference in attitude to the role and remit of fire services. So one NFCC senior manager, Francis, and everybody in the study has been given a gender neutral, different name so that people cannot be identified. One NFCC manager, Francis, 
advocated fire services as more than capable of identifying and providing psychosocial interventions, which was in real contrast to another senior NFCC manager, who I called Reese, who said it's a bit odd that fire services would be delivering psychosocial interventions and commented, I would want some sort of qualified person to do that. It doesn't sound like the sort of thing that you could pick up over a weekend's course. It sounds like you need to have the education and know what you're doing. In addition to the inconsistency on what fire services should or shouldn't be doing, there are hints here of later themes that came out more strongly, both from the National Fire Chiefs Council respondents and fire service practitioners respondents. And that is the themes of the legitimacy around this work and the recognition of what this work demands. Because if the fire setting literature for decades has been clear in stating that fire safety education to address fire setting behaviour is a specialism, it's an expertise, and many of your client group will be children with complex trauma and histories of adverse familiar life experiences that suggest that to do this work, we also need to be educated. We must know what we are doing, and that is far more than what we could pick up over a weekend's course. Thinking more about staff training and the expertise required to do this work, of the 51 fire services providing interventions, again, clearly the vast majority of fire services are training their staff to deliver this specialism. Yet we have five fire services that do not provide training to their staff for this work, and they gave reasons that included a lack of funding, budget constraints, this work isn't a service priority and in the words of one survey respondent specialist training is not a requirement of the role and so we see that at the front line there are the echoes of the opinions within or within some within the national fire chiefs council of well is this a specialism is this a requirement of the role to be trained in this field. For those fire services that do recognise the need for training and that this is a specialism, again we had inconsistency in approaches between those fire services trained by external experts and those who had been trained by internal fire service peers. In terms of external experts, <laughs> A lot of external experts going on, a bit like a lot of services going on earlier. In terms of external specialists, this included, for example, forensic psychologists, practitioners who were expert in risk behaviour and risk assessments, and those who are recognised experts in the field of fire setting behaviour. For those staff that had been trained by experts, who specialise in this field, those staff were much more likely to consider risk factors for fire setting behaviour in their decision making. And strikingly, even in the absence of risk assessment tools, those staff trained externally were more likely to make decisions in line with fourth generation practices of risk assessment and decision. They were absolutely thinking of case formulation. How do we respond to this presenting individual and their needs? Who are we liaising with? What the wider consideration? Even criminogenic factors were thought about, even if they weren't direct referenced as being so. So there were thoughts about what's the wider family here? What are the influences of this child or teenager's peer network? Are they in school? What are their other antisocial attitudes and influences potentially? So that way of thinking 
fourth generation practices were much more common and specifically looking at fire setting risk factors were much more in the decision making of staff who have been trained by non fire service peers. Also a marked inconsistency were those staff who had been trained by fire service peers were much more likely to engage in practices that are not evidence based. And for example, the use of shock tactics, which included the use of Burns images. One person I interviewed on the telephone from a fire service talked about using Burns images as a way to measure remorse and whether further intervention was needed, describing that if on a first visit to a child, they show a Burns image and that child's response is to cry, then the practitioner and the service take that as evidence of remorse and no further intervention is required. When it comes to the identification of support beyond fire safety education, it is of little surprise that when we aren't equipping our fire service staff with national guidance, standardised frameworks, no risk assessment tools, then of course practitioners are absolutely making their decisions of risk and need based on their training, where they have it, their experience, where it exists, and a commonly used phrase of gut feeling. Within the National Fire Chiefs Council interviews, there was a direct reference to decision making being influenced by an appetite for risk. And there was also an active desire that fire services have flex in their decision making. Because if you put something down formally, you'd be perhaps swayed by the process as opposed to the personality. So there was a deliberate desire within the National Fire Chiefs Council not to be directive to fire service staff in their decision making in order to have flex. Of course, we want practitioners to have innovation to use their individual professional judgment, absolutely. But we also realise from the literature that there needs to be processes and structures around that ability to be flexible. Because of course, without it, it does leave individual decision making highly vulnerable, especially in the event of further harm or fatality through a fire set by a child. And it was really interesting to see or hear on the phone and a shift often in people's demeanour and energy for this work when directly asking the question about, well, how defensible do people feel in their decision making should there be a fatal fire or fire that causes harm. On the phone, the question was often met first with silence, then nervous laughter, and then the comment, good question. And when answering that question, whether face-to-face, -face, on the phone, in a focus group, in most instances, defensible decision making came down to it's about record keeping. There was a general lack of adherence to the other principles of defensible decision making that we know include. You match the level of intervention to the risk and need presented. So this question of dosage, how many visits do you carry out to a child? Many fire services have become very directive individually in saying, right, it's one visit and one visit only, or it's a maximum of three visits. And so what we see is a mismatch between the desire within the National Fire Chiefs Council for flex, 
in decision making, but is actually now on the ground becoming quite rigid. One visit only, a maximum of three visits. And how defensible is that decision in the event of further fires? Did we really match a person's need to the intervention if we only offered one visit and one visit only? Where is the flex for our children with learning disabilities? Where is the flex for children with trauma that the literature tells us many of these children have? There is also an absence of written policies for some fire services, which again, we know from the literature is a key aspect of defensible decision making. You work within your policies and your procedures. If you do not have any, then your decision making is really vulnerable because it's likely to be inconsistent. How do you evidence it? What is your evidence base for your decision making in the absence of policies? And I was really struck by the number of people I spoke to in the telephone interviews who said that after the survey asking the question of do you have a written policy for your fire setting intervention work, it was now allowing fire services to actually think about this for the first time, to, to get a written policy or to update a policy to make sure it is current and workable. And what was also striking in this question was a belief among some managers, senior managers within the National Fire Chiefs Council, managers within fire services and practitioners at the front line, that decisions can be defended in the event of a case going wrong because of good intent. In the words of Joe, if anything does go wrong, generally one hopes the system doesn't look for blame. We know from experience that when cases go wrong, systems, politicians, the public, the media, they demand someone to blame. We saw it in phase one of the Grenfell Tower fire inquiry, where watch manager Michael Dowden was asked persistently and repeatedly about what are the policies for firefighting practices. We saw publicly a director of social services be sacked by a government minister in the event of a high profile child death, the death of baby Peter Connolly and the public sacking of Sharon Shoesmith, the director of children's social services and a tribunal later deeming that sacking to be an unfair dismissal. And if anybody is currently watching the inquest into the deaths at Fishmongers Hall, the coroner's inquest, the lawyers representing the families of Saskia Jones and Jack Merritt who were killed at that terrorist incident are asking questions about, well, what training did practitioners have and what knowledge did practitioners have of the person who carried out the deaths, their previous crimes? These are the questions that get asked when fatalities happen. Systems, people look for someone, something to blame. And when we think about the absence of policies, the absence of training, it starts to set the ground that our staff doing this work will often have an absence of their own legitimacy. Let's remind ourselves legitimacy comes from professional identity, it comes from knowing we are effective in what we do, and it comes from our relationships, predominantly our managerial and supervisory relationships and our peer relationships. Consistently within the NFCC senior manager interviews, and the telephone practitioner interviews when I was talking to people individually, there was a constant reference to others as expert, not the fire service and its practitioners as expert, but others. 
Francis within the NFCC commented, well, it's only education. You can train anybody to do a fire setter role. Jamie within the National Fire Chiefs Council talked about, you know, you pass a case on to the professionals. Reese in the NFCC commented, we're not experts. Bring people in who know what they're talking about. And this was echoed time and time again in telephone interviews with frontline fire service practitioners who say the fire service is no expert. Talk about themselves as I'm not an expert. Very much expertise, professionalism is other agencies, not fire services when it comes to this work. In contrast, where we did see high levels of staff self-legitimacy was in the, fo the focus group, where absolutely they were the experts. They acknowledged and they named their specialist role. They talked about it's a fire specialism. We are part of the jigsaw puzzle. People don't realize what an asset we are. So a marked difference between individual reflections and group reflections. The group dynamics were playing out the synergy that comes from peer support. Because this group is a group of practitioners that regularly meet together. They regularly train together with external trainers. They will visit one another to look at policies, to look at procedures, referral criteria, how are decisions made, how are cases closed. And so that synergy of peer support was playing out in the group in front of me and this is no group of nodding dogs they didn't all think the same say the same they critiqued each other they disagreed with each other they challenged one another but they could mediate together to see different perspectives to then reach an end conclusion in their decision making and when asked about where did their high regard for their work come from they attributed it to training for George. It always comes back to that. And it was endorsed by the other participants. It is again about their practice wisdom and this ability to speak regularly with one another. So when it came to legitimacy from relationships, it was always about peer relationships study participants rarely spoke about legitimating relationships coming from managers and this included the focus group for all their confidence for all their legitimacy in their professionalism and their identity even they spoke about authority members so a governing body for a fire service even they said i bet our authority members don't know we exist and parker talked about I feel fire setting work could be torn apart in a second, but I don't know how we protect ourselves from that. So Parker is starting to give this early indication of there's a vulnerability here, an exposure, an isolation, and how are they protected to the point when Parker carried on speaking, actually talked about feeling ashamed at working for a fire service because they were so unsupported by senior managers. And perhaps it is Alex that summarizes it so brutally, so honestly, when saying senior managers don't really care much, especially if fire setting interventions are done by a low life like me, a non-uniformed bloody woman. And so we start to get an insight into the very real emotional labour of this work, but how invisible it is to others outside of this work within fire services. Staff who do this work absolutely know the emotional labour. Every person interviewed spoke about having worked on cases that either involved child sexual abuse, the physical abuse of children and the criminal exploitation of children in all its many forms. And of the 15 fire service practitioners interviewed, two 
had worked with children and young people who were later killed in a fire they set or went on to kill another person. It has long been established, rightly so, the vicarious trauma that emergency service workers face in their frontline roles. The exposure to trauma of people in their worst trauma. Yet, how recognised is it that people in the fire and rescue service who work with children who set fires are also dealing with fatalities, are running the risk of vicarious trauma and other forms of trauma because of this work. And the practitioners themselves are acutely aware of all that this work demands. They talked about this work as distressing for all their love of this work, their compassion, their empathy, their commitment that makes them respond to studies in the volume that they did for all their belief in what they do. They drive to be the best at what they can do. They know this work is distressing. It's horrendous. It's upsetting. They talked about a shared pain of people who do this work. And for Billy, it causes me concern. I don't know if it causes anybody else any concern, but it causes me concern. And again, Billy gives us that insight into the invisibility of practitioners carrying this amount of responsibility and workload. And is it really causing anybody else concern? And so we recognise from the findings, the data, the openness of people within fire services, the National Fire Chiefs Council, that we have painted a problematic national picture. But for all the problems that the data has identified, there is also a real opportunity because when you get the level of engagement into this study of 100% response rate, of that number of people wanted to be interviewed or take part in focus groups, this is a workforce, this is a governing body that is engaged, that wants to know what's going on, that wants to do better, know better, do better. And so we have a real opportunity here to galvanise the energy of this study and make this research work in practice. But before we think about that and what the practitioners identified as needed, all good research will always talk about further research. Of course it does. We're forever learning. No one can no one study can answer every question far from it. This is exploratory. It's the start of this work. So absolutely there's the requirement for further research, especially in training when there are such different attitudes and service provision coming from how staff are trained or not trained then we need to be looking at okay what's the content of current fire setting intervention training who is delivering it how is it being delivered then i'd be really interested to know well, let's ask these questions within other organisations that work with children who set fires. What do youth justice think? What does social care think? What does mental health think? Because who do they see as the experts? Who should be addressing fire setting behaviour? Do they think the fire service is expert? in fire safety education and address this behaviour. So I'd really be interested to see, well, what are the attitudes of the other agencies around, well, who does this work? Who's professional and expert here? Who's accountable and responsible? And of course, when through my study came this inconsistency of dosage, one visit, maximum three, open-ended, well, what is, the appropriate, effective, ethical level of intervention. How many visits 
is indeed effective, which of course builds into the wider question we need to start answering here in the UK, which is, is what we do effective? How are we evaluating? How do we turn around and say that what we do is ethical and effective? Because currently, we have to look to the US predominantly and New Zealand for our evidence of this work being effective. We need a UK evidence base for what we do is effective. And in terms of applying research to practice, practitioners themselves highlighted the three key areas as most useful for their identification of fire setting risk and need. First and foremost, it has to be about the use of a risk assessment tool. Secondly, it has to be about training. And then it is about national written guidance that is directive around this identification of risk and need. If you go back to the 2005 ODPM evaluation, it was recommended then it talked about in its recommendations the need for accurate assessments, formal referral pathways, formal training of staff and emotional support of staff. Here we are 15 years later at the time of the study, 16 years later at the time of this presentation, and still we have this need for accurate assessments, formal training, directive guidance, formal referral pathways, emotional support for staff. If not now, when? And so in order to be a part of the journey of change, when I presented to the National Fire Chiefs Council, I said, absolutely, I can be commissioned as the author of this study, as the researcher, to undertake an immediate review of the current fire setter guidance that was asked about in the survey. 30% of staff responded saying they found the document not useful, not at all useful. So where are the current gaps? How do we start in guidance to think about, well, what are the risks in the fire setting literature? What does the defensible decision making literature say about making decisions? Where is in the fire setting guidance reference to emotional support? Where in national guidance are the recommendations from 2005? So an immediate review of, OK, what currently is in the guidance and what does it need to include can be undertaken. Similarly, the review of the fire setting training that currently takes place. And in particular, let's look at the external courses. It's allowing practitioners to make decisions based on fire setting risks, on fourth generation principles, of case management, of criminogenic needs. So what is it about these external courses that people are responding to? Is it the frequency of the training? Who's delivering the training? The content of the training? And then, of course, long term, it is about developing and testing a fire setting risk assessment tool that the research arm of the National Fire Chiefs Council could fund me to develop a fire setting risk assessment tool to test with fire services as to what is effective or not. And in my presentations to practitioners, clinicians, academics, I asked them, right, it's over to you. What do you think? These are my recommendations. This is what the data is saying. What do you think needs to happen next? What would your recommendations be? And so in the workshops I held, there were group activities where small groups of participants were asked, OK, what's your reaction to the findings? What do you think the next steps could be individually? And so locally, your fire service or your mental health team or your youth justice team, your social care team. What could the next steps be locally? Then regionally, 
then nationally and even thinking internationally when people have joined this conversation from the states from australia from new zealand children set fires not only in the uk so what could our next steps be let's think big and what's possible here and i asked the groups in their feedback to summarize in one sentence what their reflections are and so you are very welcome to do the same what are your next steps individually locally regionally nationally internationally if possible join the group on linkedin that's called talking about fire setting that connects practitioners academics clinicians internationally have a conversation be a part of a future workshop i hold if you are interested or make these changes happen if you think they're needed in your remit and absolutely if you want to you can summarize your feedback in no more than one sentence and indeed send it to me so it becomes part of the ongoing dialogue and conversation because that's the emphasis on an exploratory study this is the beginning the journey ahead might be a long one, it might be a tiring one. It's going to require financial commitment to make these things happen, to train our staff, to develop a risk assessment tool, but our staff are worthy of this investment and our children and families are more than deserving of this level of financial investment, investment of our time. And so please do feel very welcome to email me on either of the addresses and also to sign up to be in a future workshop where we come together online across continents, across disciplines to think about, OK, where are we now in our thinking of the data presented here? What are our next steps? But whatever your next step may be, maybe this is enough. I thank you for your time. It's a big thing to listen to a presentation through a screen, but I hope you have found it useful. And as I said, thank you for tuning in today, tuning in today, and for your time in letting me share and explore with you my findings. Thank you very much indeed.